Hello, I'm Dr. Louise Newson. I'm a GP and menopause specialist, and I'm also the founder of the Newson Health Menopause and Wellbeing Centre here in Stratford upon Avon. I'm also the founder of the Free Balance app. Each week on my podcast, join me and my special guests where we discuss all things perimenopause and menopause. We talk about the latest research, bust myths on menopause symptoms and treatments, and often share moving and always inspirational personal stories. This podcast is brought to you by the Newson Health Group, which has clinics across the UK dedicated to providing individualised perimenopause and menopause care for all women. So here we are in your very smart studio. Thank you. I feel very <laughs> honoured that I'm actually here doing my podcast in your space oh, with your amazing it. team. Oh, I love it's it. It's really grown it. up. Yeah. So I'm not going to really introduce you because okay. people know who you are. You've been on my podcast before. And I think when I last did do on the podcast, I said, really want to have you back. Now you're here. Yeah. I don't think, I hope this isn't going to be the last time. No, no, the I podcast. hope not. I'm sure it won't be. <laughs> and we've known each other for a little while now. And it's really inspirational, all the work you're doing. And I just love seeing what you do and how you do and you're still so happy <laughs> which is wonderful I appreciate but that. I'm here in London and you've given me like just lovely lunch no one, <laughs> no one ever cooks me lunch no one understands no one cooks you lunch you've no. been at home oh. no my husband doesn't cook oh well like I said to you on my pod anytime you're in London yeah, you come down no, here we've always got some grub it always tastes nicer when other people do it it really <laughs> yeah. does so yeah but the power of food has been underestimated for mm. far too long and mm. people are now talking about it but with so much confusion and there's all this sort of competitiveness over there that you have to have this diet or that diet yeah. and read this book or that book and what i really like about your laid-back approach is just enjoy it and mm. be happy but it's not just the eating of the food and actually one of the reasons i quite like cooking is it's part of my phone free time yeah does that make sense? 100%, like, so many people have said to me, Louise, you're so busy, you should get somebody to cook for you. And it's yeah. like, there are two reasons that I enjoy cooking. Firstly, I can oft often talk to my children because they're often milling around the kitchen and I'm there. Mm. And secondly, it is a bit of a meditation for me. I quite enjoy it. Yeah. So it's it's not just the eating, is it? Absolutely. I, I'm so glad we're talking about this because I think there's a bit of a sort of productivity hustle culture these mm. days of trying to optimize every element of our mm. life. Yes. And one of those things that a lot of people have an issue with is the need or the chore of having to cook for themselves. Yeah. And I see it through a completely different lens. Mm. And granted, I'm privileged in that my mum taught me how to cook before I went to medical school yes. and I'm an explorative cook and I love food and you yeah. know I'm a true true foodie but I also use it as part of my sort of well-being lifestyle medicine package mm. because just like you said phone free time music on yes. spices at the ready yeah. you know just sort of getting into my flow not really thinking about the day mm. I don't think about my to-do list when I'm no. cooking and if I really think about like the reason why I cook, yes, it's to nourish and yes, there are functional benefits, but it's that sort of emotional connection mm. that I have with the, the ingredients that I'm using and the sort of historical and the sort of um, cultural basis for, for the food that mm. not just is something that's passed down from my family, but it's something that I can actually have an influence on with my own family going forward yes. as well. Like I, I love the the act of of cooking for other people i'm like a typical yeah. like a, you know we just yes. did lunch for you guys did lunch with the crew mm. like it's a I great love feeling that. isn't it i love it oh, yeah I, um, it's so strange i i'm not very sociable because i work a lot but <laughs> i often invite people to my house uh -huh. because i like the privacy of being able to say anything obviously that's really good and nice but mm. also I like to be able to share different foods, but actually cooking isn't that difficult. Mm. I don't mean to be- No, 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 it's not. It doesn't but it, a lot be. of people seem really scared and often really basic things, but you just add a bit of color mm. and, or some herbs. Mm. You're like, oh my goodness, but you've been working all day. Yeah, but I prepared it last night. It yeah. sort of cooks itself. <laughs> yeah. It's not, sometimes it's not difficult, is it? But it's, um, but it's so easy now to, on an app, just deliver something yeah. or to order something. But it, it tastes different when you've, when you've prepared it somehow I totally it's, totally and it and it so i think there's so much about eating is really important we'll talk about things to eat 
But I do think we shouldn't, I mean, I'm really up for life hacks. I'm really up for maximizing my productivity. I'm, you know, I'm really happy for someone else to do my washing. I'm really happy for someone else to do the ironing. Yeah. Someone else can clean the toilets. That's fine. That's not going to make me a better person. But actually, some people do like that whole ritual of cleaning. So that's fine if they do. But I actually personally would prefer to to write some papers and do something else. Yeah, yeah. But but actually, cooking is really important because actually, I want to know what's in my food. Mm. I really want to know because I don't want to have any additives. I don't want to have anything that's going to trigger migraines. So I have that as my, as I've said to you before, I'm lucky, but I'm not lucky having migraines because they control my life but I love not having a headache. So I'll do anything, including eat really healthily to totally, not have a headache. Totally. So it's not just because I want to feel good or look good or whatever. It's because I really don't want to be flawed with migraines. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm obsessed because I don't want to have chemicals that I don't need. But actually it's really joyful to be able to cook. And we have a veggie box delivered because again, one of my hacks is I don't like going shopping because I don't have much time. Yeah. But I want to eat really healthily. And I know veggie box are expensive, but I don't have any waste. Yes. But I also like the mystery. I never I never look and see what's going. And so it came on Wednesday. My husband was at home and I came back on Wednesday night, a bit excited, because like, what am I going to cook? And he said, oh, I didn't come this morning. I said, what do you mean it hasn't come? Anyway, he put it all away, which he doesn't often. <laughs> so I was like, open the fridge and it's like opening a sweetie cup. Yeah, really. yeah. And I, thought, oh, this is really exciting, actually, because it's all in season. Totally. And that totally. makes a real difference. And it's uh, really sad. I'm, like, if I'd met you 10 years ago, I could not talk with excitement about a veggie box. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. eating in season is cheaper as well, isn't it? And it yeah. just makes it easier. Totally, yeah. And it's so funny that you're saying that because I think part of the excitement that I have around cooking is actually what am I going to cook? I'm not mm. one of these people, even though I've got like, you know, recipe books and people love recipes and following the instructions and all the rest of it. I get that. I'm a really sort of intuitive cook. Mm. So kind of like you open up the store cupboard or the uh, go into the pantry or uh, look into my, in, into my fridge and figure out what to mm. make. So what I made you earlier today, I didn't know that I was going to make that. No. So it literally, I was using odd bits of uh, what we'd made in recipes earlier this week. So there's a bit of grated courgette. Mm. There was um, a leftover white beans. Everything was in date, don't worry. <laughs> Thanks, that was much better. <laughs> big effort for your guests. Uh, we had some a big mix of herbs. Uh, I used some frozen peas and frozen spinach, mm. which are my two life hacks, I yeah, think. Really, really, really good, really good yeah. items to always have in your freezer. Mm. And then some veg stock and a whole bunch of spices that, mm. you know, won't go off as long as, you know, you, you haven't got them in your pantry for like years mm. and you smell them and mm. they smell aromatic or they smell fresh and they've got that sort of mm. odor, the, the the pungency that they mm. should have, then you can still use them and they mm. confer lots of benefits. Mm. Um, that That's sort of like how I made that meal. So I put everything into one pan. I blended up the spinach and the peas with a little bit of hot water and yeah. veg stock to create that like green, glorious looking mm. silky sauce added that to the ingredients added the protein so we added a bit of um halloumi but it could be pan fried mm. uh tofu instead as your plant-based protein some beans you could add lentils mm. you could have leftover chicken if you like and that is a meal in one yes. pan and so yeah. there's minimal washing up you can serve people and it tastes delicious mm. so when you know the sort of basics of flavor and it doesn't need yeah. to be, you don't need to be a jamie oliver no. to, to to be able to do this just learn some basics mm. and you'd be surprised at a how enjoyable it is and how flavorful it can mm. be and the functional benefits as well yeah and those. i also like you're the same as me you cook more because then you can open your fridge when you're hungry and there's something there for you to totally. eat yeah and that's really important and you spend less yeah, you of course absolutely you will. Yeah. spend less we yeah. did this exercise actually with um BBC Food that people can 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 look at right now. You just type mm. in BBC Food budget meals, doctors kitchen, and we did this project where we looked at it was at the height of the cost of living crisis. It was um, November last year, something like that, and we looked at all the different supermarkets. And it was just like a big spreadsheet of all the different common ingredients that you find things like mushrooms they're quite expensive actually mm. beans uh whatever veggies were in season and i had i was tasked to get a one pound per serving meal that was healthy and mm. delicious and flavorful and easy to cook mm. and we managed to do it one pound per serving and it's three portions of three proper portions mm, of vegetables great, and every serving mm. of these meals 
And we got it down to a meal plan as well that you, again, you can get on the BBC mm. website or the Doctor's Kitchen website, um, where we, we spend about 20 pounds per week. And the, the hacks, the reasons why you're able to achieve that is if you have 12 key spices and they're very simple things, cumin, paprika, chili flakes, uh, I think there was some Mediterranean herbs and spices in there, like oregano. Mm. If you've got those 12 and you've got some olive oil, chef's knife, chopping board, a decent pan, you're, you're on your way. Yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. on your way. Yeah. Um, so, I, and I think those kind of exercises challenge me to really think about, mm. okay, if I am in dire straits, if I do only have 20 pounds per week to feed mm. myself, and another person, can I do it? Mm. Yes, yes, it is yeah. possible, but it does require that sort of culinary creativity, the ingenuity yeah. and the the effort needed to to, to produce those kinds yeah. of things. Yeah, I mean, my um, oldest two children are at university and I batch cooked a whole bolognese for them. Yeah. And I, split it up and gave it to them recently when I've just met them and I, they were so excited but I had put loads of vegetables and lentils in it like, yeah. but if I gave my especially my middle daughter a bowl of lentils there's no way on earth she'd eat it <laughs> but she was sharing with her friends because oh there's something like, was it peas in there I said no it was lentils Sophie but it makes it cheaper it spreads the meat yeah. you know and yeah. it's really healthy still as well totally. so I think modifying things is really important mm. knowing that it's cheaper but also, like, I don't drink alcohol because of my migraines. My daughter doesn't because of migraines. She's a student. So sometimes she will go and buy a nicer piece of meat or something that's slightly more expensive because it's cheaper than going and buying a pint of beer. Yeah. And so I think we have to sort of, when you think about our budgets, Yeah. it's like, do I get more pleasure from a glass of wine or do I get it from a really... And when you eat really good food, it will make you happy. It yeah. does improve your serotonin levels, Absolutely. doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. When you're eating better food, you're getting more diversity of ingredients. Mm. We know that that's going to be supporting your microbes. And it's simple things like spices that have a higher antioxidant score, you have simple diversity of different types of fibers as well. It could be some simple things like celery or radicchio or uh, radishes or uh, endive, whatever you can find. And I've just said some bougie ingredients there, but you know, kale. But celery stems. is. So, I mean, celery is not that big, is it? <laughs> and, and actually, a lot of people think, what's the point? It's just water, but it, it is really good, isn't it? You know, it's it? interesting. So we mm. did, um, I, I used to think the same thing mm. about celery. That's just mainly water. Yeah. There's nothing in it. So we do know it's got some prebiotic fibers in there. Which so is just really explain what prebiotic, because so lots pre of people get confused. Totally, don't they? yeah. And that's a really yeah. good point. So uh, you've got different types of fibers yeah. in your diet. Um, you know, we get them from a variety of different sources largely uh, cover, or you find them in plants. Mm. Um, and the different types of fibers are prebiotic and you've got other sort of just regular fibers yeah. as well and different types of starches. Prebiotic fibers are unique in that they can um, improve the the how um, your, your microbes in your gut thrive mm. and essentially uniquely improves that gut flora that you mm. find mainly in the large intestine. So the types of fibers that we think of with regards to whole food ingredients that have these unique fibers, are asparagus, chicory, things like garlic as well, mm. brassica vegetables. These are really, really interesting sorts of fibers. But within the sort of category of prebiotic fibers there are hundreds of different subtypes as well, many of which like have long you know, mm. names like oligosaccharides, for example. Um, and it is a fascinating world when you go into it and the best thing about it is that they are a lot cheaper than some of the gut health supplements that you find yes. on the supermarket shelves. Yeah. And prebiotics is actually where we need to put a lot more mm. of our attention rather than just probiotics. Probiotics are fantastic. I love fermenting. I love like adding, you know, sauerkrauts and kimchi, mm. all those like wonderful live microbes to your food. But prebiotics is probably where we're lacking a bit more. Yeah, so it's yeah. important to know the difference, isn't it? Because they're both really important for us. And I think for many years, we haven't, we still don't understand enough about the gut microbes, mm. but we are realizing more and more how important they are. So that whole thing of eating the rainbow. Yeah, yeah. Is actually really important, isn't it? Yeah, like yeah. We've got a, a variety of the spice of life, isn't it? You yeah, know? And yeah. I sort of think back about my meat and two veg existence in the 70s actually it was going to the butchers for the meat it was actually eating in season so it was a lot better than meat and two veg now because food's changed over yeah, the years hasn't massive, it massive. And so you know my mum sometimes says oh but it didn't harm you having that why are you getting so doing this for the children because food is different Definitely. and the soil that the 
you know, vegetables are grown in is quite different Absolutely. as well, isn't it? There's a lot of differences. And we, we did a deep dive into this actually on the podcast with regards to organic versus mm. conventional food. Mm. And I don't want to worry anyone, but the, the two senses, like if you can go organic, great. Does it mean that you're going to be protecting yourself from all pesticides? No. No. Does it mean that there is a, a potential benefit to longevity, the quality of the polyphenols, the increase in the amount of these different plant chemicals that confer benefits? Potentially, yes, actually. Mm. So if you can, great. But am I going to lose sleep over it if I go out and I, I'm eating conventional vegetables? No, I'm not. No, I just yeah. And the variety piece, I think, is really important as well because I think there's a, there's a difference between surviving and thriving and mm. i think when you get that rainbow you are thriving mm. you are really pushing mm. the bow out in terms of improving your health improving your well-being improving your mental well-being improving the function yeah. of those gut microbes so that sort of uh, uh, element i think is really important when, mm. when we when we discuss food going back to celery so uh, it's a prebiotic uh, fibers yes it's like largely water if you want to think about it in that way but it also has a surprising high amount of nitrates so nitrates are really interesting because um, they are constituents in plants that we absorb from the soil. Mm. So if you remember back to your sort of school chemistry days, you've got the nitrogen cycle. It's absorbed into plants and then it's converted into nitrates, which mm. is NO3 minus, I think. Um, and that is only absorbable from the plants that we mm. consume. It's added as an additive mm. to things like processed meats, which is where nitrites get yeah, a bad rep. Yeah. But when it's nitrate in plants, it's quite combined, different. Bind, yeah, with those polyphenols, vitamin C, mm. vitamin E, that's where it can be better converted into nitric oxide. Mm. And that nitric oxide is what vasodilates our blood vessels, so it brings the blood pressure down, improves blood flow through the brain as well cardiovascular benefits, as mm. I mentioned, with blood pressure mm. and uh, and also metabolic effects as well, strangely mm. enough. So celery is actually one of those things that we should be getting, it's... as well as kale and other cruciferous vegetables that are quite high in nitrates and beetroots, which is the classic nitrate rich food. Yeah, it's not interesting. And you know what else also affects nitric oxide production, of course, is estrogen. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. And when you think about cardiovascular health, you know, anything that we can do that keep the lining of the vessels open, reduce atheroma, is really important, isn't it? Mm. So thinking about mm, food as medicine, but not medicine to treat disease, but prevent disease yeah. is really important. And I'm going to put this podcast out in January. Yeah. So it's new year, new you. We're all thinking about new year's resolutions and it's always about what am I going to stop? I'm mm. going to you know, reduce alcohol juice. But actually I'd like some tips about what can I add? Yeah. What will I add to my foods? Yeah. That yeah. Um, even if I don't change my diet, what would you say would be really important to think of over the year to yeah. just add to improve health? Yeah, definitely. So I think the first thing, just taking one step back is New Year, New You is that always that sort of difficult time of year where people are jumping onto a particular trend mm. or, you know, with the with the purest and righteousness of intentions, it's like, this is the year I'm going to do yeah, better. And I get it. I completely yeah. get it. But I think if I could welcome people to just take a step back and just think of the key metric that will enable you to live and thrive for life, it's consistency. Mm. It is pure consistency. So if you can think about food through the lens of can I add just one more fruit, vegetable, nut or seed at every meal time? Mm. That's a really good way yeah. of introducing a tiny habit yeah. that has vast implications. So just like a handful of seeds. Handful of seeds. Handful of nuts. Doesn't matter what nuts. Doesn't really matter. No. I mean, like I have a personal favorite, which is um, hazelnuts. Yeah. Um, I think they're like really easy. You could the, you can use them in savory. You can use them in yeah. sweet. You could they they're beautiful toasted, blanched, whatever. Like I just think and they're it's quite a, cheap actually. They are, yeah. Because nuts are really expensive. They can you know, be. You buy get a the small bag. It's like oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But actually, hazelnuts. And I was cooking your um, aubergine. There's an aubergine, oh, yeah. and you said, "Oh, you can use hazelnuts." Gosh, hazelnuts yeah. <laughs> with an aubergine. That's yeah. a bit weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's great. Yeah. And actually, it's a really quick way, isn't it, of yeah. transforming, like you say, sweet or savory. So yes, yeah, so the seeds, nuts spices herbs but they don't all have to be fresh do they, they don't always have to be fresh actually i think dried uh, herbs mm. are particularly interesting because they're dehydrated you're getting a lot more bang for your buck and they actually preserve quite a lot of the nutrients as well okay so that's you good. get a different flavor profile you do. so yeah. like with fresh tarragon that's finely chopped over i don't know some um some 
eggs or uh, scrambled tofu or whatever, it's going to taste completely different to dry tarragon, mm. which has a more intense sort of pungent flavor. Mm. But the, you are introducing like a quarter plant point, you're introducing more antioxidants, yeah. and you're having a higher uh, diversity of those antioxidants yeah. as well in, in your food, which is really, really important. So wherever possible, I always say, experiment with spices, experiment mm. with herbs. It's really, really interesting. Um, particularly when you look at it through the lens of what the diversity of those different ingredients are mm. adding to your mi mm. your microbes. I always like to tell people to think of their microbes as like bored children on a summer holiday. You need to feed them interesting yes. bits of information mm. from in the, in the medium of food to keep them activated, to yes. keep them thriving. Yeah, so they can do all those really wonderful analogy, things. Isn't it? So yeah, yeah, yeah. bored yeah. kids and summer holiday, yeah. give them loads of interesting things to But to that's why I think it's them. really important when I said about adding, because I've seen so many patients who said, yeah, I'm really not eating much at all. And then you hear what they're eating, like, oh my goodness, that's not only really dull, but you're just starving yourself, yeah. actually. Yeah. And they're counting the calories, and the calories, yeah, might add up to whatever. Yeah. But it's not really about calories. No, it's no. about the enjoyment and and actually, you know, these people often feel hungry all day. So mm. all they're doing is thinking about food. Yeah. It's like yeah. once you say you're on a diet, the only thing you think about is food. So I think we should be looking at food in a different way, isn't it? I yeah, think I, I, I think like uh, the the calorie side of things is really interesting mm. because we know that energy balance, yes, is important. We know, yes, that if you were to maintain a calorie deficit, you will lose weight. But what I'm thinking of is the consistency. And this mm. isn't just a plan for January to March. It's a plan for life. Yeah. And is calorie counting a good exercise for most people i would say no mm. it doesn't is mm. it effective for weight loss is it great for bodybuilders mm. is it great for people who have uh, a, a, the need to do it mm. athletes etc yeah. yeah great that's very different isn't it very different for yeah. a real real world yeah. sort of scenario yeah. for people who are just looking to feel better in themselves mm. improve their mental clarity improve sort of other aspects of yeah. their life it's not all about calories so that's that's sort of like my, my two cents on calories and I think I'm glad we're talking about what you can add to food mm. because I have this sort of idea of like, okay, what are 60 second hacks that everyone can do mm. to improve the nutrient density of their food? So one is, yes, mm. adding nuts and mm. seeds to, to each meal, chopping up some sort of dark leafy green and adding yes. that to either your breakfast, lunch or dinner. Yeah. Good from the nitrate point of view, yeah. great from the anti-inflammatory point of view as well. Adding any sort of spice mm. in, in addition to your spice. If you're using fennel, use cumin if you if you're adding cinnamon add chili mm. there's a really interesting sort of um spice wheel that you can just get a pdf mm. of just type in spice wheel and it will give you pairings of mm, different nice. spices yeah. that you can use so if you're if you've got a recipe and it calls for oregano look at the spice wheel and say okay what else can i add to that mm. can i add a fennel seed can i add a cumin to that can nice, i add yeah. a sumac you mm. know does that give me sort of like a reason to pick another spice mm. bottle up from the supermarket mm. you're always going to be adding some yes. antioxidant to it and it's and it's a really really nice little oh, i like hack. that yeah and the other thing i would say in terms of additions is even if you've got a spag bowl like you you're saying your daughter's you know, can you add lentils to it? Yeah. Can you add pre-cooked chickpeas? Can mm. you add some sort of um, legume to your, mm. your diet? That's going to be increasing fiber because mm. where there appears to be some sort of marketing hype around protein and ensuring that we are protein replete, which most of us are, I would say, mm. um, we're really fiber deficient. Yes. Because a lot of our diet is refined. Yeah. And a lot of the, the sort of the husks around our rice, mm the the wholeness nature of our grains has been polished mm. down and so actually we need to be thinking about where we can add fiber so yeah. legumes lentils policies these are great ways yeah. to add not necessarily removing the meat if you don't want to but certainly adding it to it yeah again adding to your diversity score and adding to your plant points yeah. as well i think that's it's that's really important isn't it i think mm. the it, it's so easy just to strip things back and and punish ourselves yeah. which we really shouldn't but Obviously, we've got to talk a bit about perimenopause and menopause. Yeah. Whereas you can't come onto a menopause yeah, podcast yeah. And, and not talk about that. But people find that their diets do change in the perimenopause and menopause. But some of it, I think, is a age-related rather than a hormone-related. So I'm a 
menopausal woman, obviously, and I take hormones, but actually I can't eat the same as I ate when I was 20. Mm. That's not because I'm menopausal. That's just because my metabolism is different. And sometimes it's really easy to sort of almost blame the menopause or there's so many people that try and eat their way out of the menopause. And then I feel sorry for these people because how can you eat to replace a missing hormone? Yeah. You can't, but of course you can eat to feel better. Yeah. And I think we have to be really clear that it's it's a different thing, isn't it? Yeah. So I think there have been studies showing that if you reduce spicy food, you can have less hot flushes. Now is hot flushes more important than spicy food? And actually, do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's where it comes back to choice. Yes, like totally. I might say, do you know what? I want to have a flush because I want to eat this food. Yeah, yeah. But actually, more importantly, why am I having a flush? What can I do about that? Yeah, yeah. But even more importantly than that, as a menopausal woman, regardless of my hormonal status, how am I going to um, how am I how am I going to try and eat the best for my metabolism? Yeah. And is my metabolism different because I'm menopausal or is yeah. it different because of my age or is it yeah. different because I exercise differently? Like, yeah. How do we know when you're deciding what to eat? Totally, yeah. And it's interesting because we were talking about this because I asked you the same question yeah. around weight and stuff and we were talking about how, you know, when you are uh, menopausal, not to get too de- depressed about it, it's you, you, your fat cells are going to be bloated mm. and they're going to increase them because of the estrone content of those, which is that low uh, dose sort of estrogen analog. Um, which is why you get that middle age spread. Your testosterone level is going to be low, so you're not going to be able to. Com- you're going to potentially be at worse risk of sarcopenia, which is that mm. breakdown of the, the muscle and a, a higher amount of, of fat, both visceral and subcutaneous. And then you're going to have cognitive issues, which means you're going to be less motivated mm. to go to go to the gym. So that could also lead to. So there's all these other mm. things. So like like we were talking about, it's taking a step back and just appreciating that your body is in a state of flux mm. and it's a different ball game. Mm. That being said, last time we were on the pod together, I told you about the app and the yes. health goals that we had. And you were like, do you have a menopausal health goal? Yeah. And I was like, no, no. we don't. But I'm, but we've been working on it. We've been working on it a lot. So we, we did a deep dive into the dietary patterns mm. that are associated with better uh, menopausal health uh, mm. outcomes from a symptom point mm. of view. And we also looked at particular ingredients as well which i think are interesting yes. but not necessarily universal for everyone because mm. there's a di- there's a study regarding prunes and it apparently improved ma- vasomotor symptoms in four no 80 women uh yeah. in, a, in an rct that was done in iran um and you know it, that's that's I you know just that, prunes but... and it's yeah, yeah. And it's just it's prunes and it you know yeah. it's got a lot of sugar they're yes. usually dried it's not going to be for yeah. everyone no there's only so much you can take from that. Mm. So when we look at the studies, we, we blend sort of the, the bigger ones. The biggest one I think is the most important is um, the DII. So it's the Dietary Inflammatory Index, mm. which again is another health goal, infl- in, inflammation reducing. And the things that move the needle on the DII, which is this validated food score, are things that we've just been talking about. So spices, mm. which have the highest antioxidant score as measured by something called the ORAC, um, lentils and mm. pulses, and those uh, colorful vegetables Mm. as well. So if you're packing your diet full of those, you're reducing your inflammation index, and that potentially is gonna reflect better on typical symptoms of the menopause, whether it's vasomotor, whether whether it's also osteoporosis as well. There are some uh, really interesting studies looking at that. Generally, like I said right at the start, it comes down to consistency. Because a lot of people, we were talking about this earlier, weren't we, about how, you know, for you, it's kind of like a blessing and a curse that you have migraines as mm. and it's related to processed food. It means that on a Friday, you know... I can't slip up. You can't slip up. You can't just order that takeaway pizza. No. You can't just have a Mackie D's or whatever. No. Like, you gotta, you got to yeah. be strict because there's there's a yeah. stick, you know. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people don't have that. No. And, and, you know, I think it's a good thing that people can indulge in junk food, but it really comes down to the consistency. Can mm. you consistently... Can you... Yes. Go for that 80 20, yeah, or like I say, 90 10. Because yeah. if you aim for 90 10, then it slips, you probably okay. get to 80 yeah. 20, yeah. yeah. So that's super important. Yeah. What do all these diets really mm. mean? It's basically having m- a lot more fiber in our diets, mm. mainly from things like legumes, pulses, and those, um, uh, those dark green leafy vegetables, mm. having lots of different herbs and spices again, lowering those inflammation, the inflammation index, and having a predominantly plant based diet yeah. as well doesn't mean that you need to be vegan or vegetarian 
but the more plants in your mm. diet, the better. There was also an interesting study looking at protein. We mm, talked a bit yeah. about protein before. So there appears to be somewhat of a protective effect of plant-based proteins on uh, menopausal mm. symptoms, not so much animal-based proteins. Mm. There doesn't appear to be any effect at all. Now, does that mean that we all need to start eating tofu or tempeh? Not necessarily, because you know not everyone likes tofu or tempeh mm. and it doesn't necessarily mean because nutrition as we we're saying is very very complicated there's so many issues yes, is. with the quality of the research but certainly having more hemp seeds mm. in your diet that's mm. a very good source of plant-based protein having a lot more nuts and seeds mm. again very good sources of plant-based protein raw cacao actually is one of my favorites really high in uh, plant-based protein and is one of those that has all nine essential amino acids which is quite rare for a, yeah, a plant-based yeah. protein um and uh I was going to say tempeh again. It's actually one of my favorites. I think having tempeh in your diet is actually quite yeah. a, a good plant-based protein. And it's interesting because you say about all of these will help reduce inflammation. Mm. So that is also showing it's not just about symptoms. Because I think when we're looking at menopause as long term, because it is, it's associated with inflammation. So whether we take hormones or not, we want to reduce inflammation because we want to reduce disease. Yes. So it's interesting that these foods that you're talking about yeah so whether someone's listening and they have one symptom or 21 symptoms or 51 or none yeah it's irrelevant actually because it's thinking about inflammation as it's well, a really which... good point yeah and I'm, I'm glad you're doing a deep dive into inflammation because mm. i think that should become a lot more sort of wide widely known because mm. it is something that will affect everyone of course you know it does. As, as you yeah. as you grow older and sarcopenia being a, a, a big mm. issue and, and very much related to that and you know just getting some sort of practical tips um, into people's head what does this look like what does a dii friendly diet look like what does a mediterranean friendly mm. diet look like it could be as simple as like a sweet potato lentil feta and pomegranate diversity bowl it nice. can be a plant-based sort of um take on a chicken masala with mm. like air fried i know i'm a big fan of air frying i know, I know i'm gonna convince you because i know you've got yeah. an agar. but like air fried tempeh or air fried tofu and adding mm. that into the base of a rich sort of tomato sauce yes. that's got loads of those different spices in you know and adding spinach to that it's like the lunch that i made you earlier the spinach mm. and pea green mm. sort of silky sauce that you can throw anything into it we threw beans in it lentils in it and we added some uh halloumi that we just mm. lightly fried so getting really explorative about your food and actually enjoying this phase of where you're experimenting with all these different yeah. elements that we know reduce inflammation, improve your gut well-being, and improve your likelihood of, of thriving into, into old age. Which is so, so important. So before we finish, there's always three take-home tips. Okay. So new year, new you, reduce inflammation, increase fiber. What are the three things not just for people who are menopausal, but for whole families, because mm. I strongly feel we shouldn't be eating different things to others because we're hormonal or menopausal or whatever. Definitely. We should be converting everybody around us. So family, friends, whoever steps in our houses should be looking at our cupboards and fridges and learning. Definitely. So what are the three things that you think we should all be proud of that we've changed this year for yeah our food. I, I i think um it's not always food related in, in my mind mm. but i think everyone should master like one meal that mm. they can sort of add on different sort of journeys to you yeah. know choose your own adventure sort yeah. of meals so having a really solid base it might be like your favorite meal like a spag bowl mm. and then adding twists to it yeah. with different vegetables different types of legumes different sort of other other sort of flavor mm. bases different types of you know the actual pasta itself there's loads of really good sort of mm. edamame based pastas yeah. for example that i think are great so i think mastering one meal and being mm. proud of that and actually getting everyone involved in that i think particularly if you have kids I, I get asked this a lot if a child particularly in those in their formative years doesn't like a particular ingredient don't force it yeah because that that will introduce animosity yeah. towards that ingredient and actually there's there's a lot of evidence to show that kids will be averse to certain bitter flavors mm. as a sort of an evolutionary protective measure so when you come back to it when they're older they may have developed different taste mm. buds that will allow them to appreciate it better mm. i always hated mushrooms until i was a teenager yeah. and I, I started having mushrooms again it was delicious mm. so you know and, and luckily my parents didn't force mushrooms on me so like when you've got kids mm. i'd always like just be a little more gentle about it and I would say 
if you can go for that 80 20 or the 90 10 go for 90 10 because you probably will get to 80 20 yeah. and i think that's worth just harboring again mm. because a lot of people feel that you have to be 100 yeah. percent strict and if you do have a cheeky takeout where you do have that sort of can't be asked feeling you know at, at the end of the week indulge allow yourself to indulge yeah. without any guilt particularly as it pertains to food and then make yourself a mm. contract make yourself a pack to get back on it the following yeah. day and and you know it could be you know whatever meal you like as long as it's packing it with those mm. high fiber ingredients lots of variety and hopefully getting some spice and herbs in there great advice thank you ever so much and thanks ever so much for your time and the my loan of your pleasure. studio my pleasure my pleasure i can't wait till the next time me too thanks <laughs> You can find out more about Newson Health Group by visiting www.newsonhealth.co.uk and you can download the free Balance app on the App Store or Google Play.